Good evening, everybody. Uh, Martin Crabtree from the library and such. We're going to be talking about library information, finding, using information and such in preparation for your first uh, essay and research log for English 102. Things we'll be talking about this evening. Firstly, I just want to talk about electronic searching a bit. Uh, we've all done this. We've been to Google, put a you know word into a box, click search, click go, things like that. But um, what I want to talk about are things that will hopefully make you more effective, efficient searchers. So you spend a little less time looking, a little more time using what you find. We'll talk about the databases, those collections of articles from magazines, newspapers, scholarly journals and such that are available to you online from the college library. How do we get to them? Which ones might be uh, helpful for your uh, current work and things like that? And also we want to make sure that we give credit to the authors of the works you're using. You'll be using other people's thoughts, words, and ideas and incorporating this into your writing in this course. And you're expected to include credit for those people using the MLA citation format. And we'll touch on some of the things on that as well. I always like to start with my shameless plug for the library. The library's here to help you. That's what we do at the library. It's what I do. It's what I think you know is really important in my, my profession. Uh, there are many things that I'm involved with here at the college. But the most important thing to me personally is that I believe I'm here to help every single student that comes through physically or virtually through our college to be a successful student. I can't do everything to make you a successful student. I'm not going to come over to your house to help you study for a test. Um, if you're kind of, you know, dozing off in the middle of this, I won't be able to kind of come by and shake your chair and wake you up. Uh, what I can help you with is information. You will need information in some way, shape, or form throughout your college career. You need it for this course. You'll need it for pretty much every other course you'll ever take in college. And that's where I can help you. I can help you locate the information you need, be it for an assignment, to write a paper, um, give a speech, anything like that. So anytime you need information, please feel free to contact our library. You can stop on by, call us up, email us and such. Always be glad to help you out. Now you notice I keep saying help. I haven't said give you information. I do not often give out information just freely when it comes to coursework and such. Because part of what I believe is important for you to be a successful student is to have some of those skills and tools to find information on your own. You should be able to locate information on your own as well. And when you get stuck, that's where somebody like myself comes in. You know, it's, I can't find a book on this topic. Um, I can't find any articles. I think there should be some on this topic. Uh, I found an article, but I can't find the whole article. I just get a summary and nothing else. Always glad to help you out. So please feel free to ask for help. Now I have a personal, I have a question for you. And we got the first of the uh, polls coming up. What's your personal best when you've done a web search? Has anybody gotten 100,000 hits, a million hits, 10 million, 100 million, or even more than that? We'll give you a moment to kind of click in on your, uh, your answer here, see where, where people uh, kind of lie. And it looks like the never noticed are uh, coming out on top tonight. And that, that's kind of uh, you know interesting to see because many people do not really take note of you know how many hits they've gotten in a uh, in a web search. A um, web search, many of the major search engines, Google, Bing, things like that, um, they all will give you an estimate of how many hits you get near the top of the page, and you'd be surprised how many hits you actually get in a uh, in a web search. And I bring up this question because it really begs the next question. Do you really want to have to look through all that stuff? And I think not. The objective of a search tool like Google, Bing, whatever, a database search of articles is for finding information, not looking for information. I make a big you know, difference between those two. A tool like a Google is for finding something. I have an information need. I need to find information so I can do something, write a paper, find out what time the movie starts tonight, whatever it might be. And consequently, um, we really don't want to have to go through all these, these hits if we don't have to. So I want to spend a little time talking about looking for information, using a computer to find information in our databases, web searching. The, the, the principles are relatively the same. And you know, when we do a, a web search, we really don't think much about what's going on with that computer. And the first step in really even beginning your search isn't 
than going to the computer and, you know, throwing a word into a box and hoping for the best. It's thinking about what am I trying to find? What information am I looking for? What do I need? Because the better the topic you have in mind, the better understanding you have of the, the uh, assignment and everything else will certainly make it easier for you in the long run if you spend a few moments thinking about what is it I'm just trying to find? What might be some of the interesting discussions or subject areas involved with the, you know, the broad topic that I'm trying to work with for my assignment? Now, if you find that your topic's kind of broad, vague, you're not quite sure exactly what you're, um, you're looking for, don't worry. That's normal and natural. Uh, there's been a lot of research done on researching, where researchers have actually followed students through a whole research process from the time they're told they have an assignment to the time they turn in that completed assignment and kind of follow them through the process. And they find, and you've probably run into this from time to time yourself in uh, previous research, sometimes you start out very vague and loose and uncomfortable. I don't know what I'm trying to find. You may, you know, search, um, do some searches that are not very fruitful initially and you get, you know, maybe feel a little frustrated. That's normal and natural. But as you work your way through things, and if you kind of think back to previous research you may have worked on in the past, you'll find, and I, fi I find it for myself, that sometimes, well not sometimes, every time I eventually reach a point where it's kind of like, okay, I get it. It's almost like kind of coming up a hill and then coming back down that hill again. Um, it's tough going up, but then you hit the downhill part and you know what you're looking for, you just have to find it, the paper's starting to come together in your mind, and you can kind of, you know, finish out and it's not so bad. So expect also your, your topics to shift a little bit, particularly early on as you kind of see what information's out there, you start kind of putting the pieces together. Research is not a, a, always a quick and easy process. You don't put one word into Google, click search, you get the first result is what you need to write a perfect, you know, five-page paper. It's kind of a building process. You find a little information here, a little information there, and you kind of build up and gather a collection of information that will ultimately help you write that paper. But uh, expect your topic to shift around a little bit as you move along. Now, when we actually use the computer, the box in front of you, or the laptop, or the tablet, or whatever you're using, that piece of equipment we treat like an appliance these days. We don't think about them much about how they work or anything. We just plug them in, and they're supposed to go, and they do what we want them to do. But I want to talk about these appliances. You know, in some ways, we treat a computer like a toaster, like a television, like a refrigerator. And um, we really need to understand a little bit about what happens. So you go to Google, you put a word in a box, you click search, you click go, and you get a result. What happens during that instant between the time you click on the, the search button and you get your results, we don't think about what happens during that instant. I want to talk about it for a moment. <coughs> Excuse me. For example, say we put in the word Trenton and click our search. That search tool, be it Google, a database search, whatever, it has no idea what you meant by the word Trenton. You Type in Trenton, you're thinking, okay, I put in Trenton. To the computer, you're asking for just a series of letters. You're asking for the letter T, followed by R, followed by E, followed by N, etc. And that's all, all the, the search tool knows. It has no idea what the meaning of that word Trenton. Um, are you talking about the city, state capital of New Jersey, Trenton, New Jersey? Perhaps. Maybe it's a different Trenton. There are others out there. Alabama has one. Michigan has one. State of Wisconsin has two Trentons. Maybe it's one of these other Trentons. Maybe it's somebody's name, first name, last name, happens to be Trenton. Perhaps you're doing American history research, Revolutionary War, the Battle of Trenton, George Washington crossing the Delaware, all that stuff. Again, there's that word Trenton. And just by putting in that single word Trenton, all of that stuff will wind up in your list. And then you have to kind of sort through it. The first step in doing any effective searching once you get going is to think about what is it I'm looking for? What terms, what keywords, that's what we call the, the words we put into the box. What keywords do I want to really see? If I had the perfect website, the perfect article on the screen, what might be you know, the words that I would expect to see in that perfect article and such? And sometimes it might help to write things down. I know it, it's sometimes helpful for me to think about that as well. Now you have some of these words in mind, you can start manipulating them, kind of speak a bit of the language the computer will understand a little bit better. Boolean searching, Boolean logic, the terms are used interchangeably, and it involves connecting your keywords with three words, and, not, or, or, to better define what you're looking for. 
For example, say you're in a biology class and you're studying birds. Everybody in the class is going to give a an assi you know written assignment about a given given bird. You've been given eagles to write your your paper on. You could go to Google, something like that, throw in eagles, get information about bald eagles, golden eagles, things like that, and complete your assignment. However, it's going to be a little harder because Philadelphia Eagles football team information, college, high school teams that are known as the Eagles as well will be mixed in with that set of results. And by doing a search of Eagles, not football, you can basically tell that search tool, Eagles, I got to see it in my results, but you do not want to see football. You do not want to see football so badly that even if the word Eagles, the one you asked for is there, it's still not on the list. You never, ever, ever want to see football. You want to get rid of all that stuff in one shot. You can use parentheses to group things together, kind of like you do with arithmetic, 2 plus 3 in parentheses times 5. Example I have on the screen, air or water and pollution. You're doing pollution research. You're interested in both air and water pollution kind of have yourself covered. They use either of those two words or both the words air and water. It hits as long as the word pollution is included as well. If you um, are looking for a phrase, words that are side by side by side in a specific order, tell that search tool you want words only in that order by using quotation marks. Putting quotation marks around a series of, of words will allow that search tool to understand, you know, I want these just in this order, not kind of interspersed anywhere within the, the document. Survival of the fittest on the screen, Mercer County Community College, United States of America. There are a lot of phrases you may be looking for. A proper name, somebody's name, Joseph Campbell, for example, would all be, you know, you put it in quotation marks and again, helps you focus in. Generally speaking, the more terms you use, the more keywords you have, the fewer hits you're going to get. And the objective is really to get a shorter list with more relevant uh, items on the list. So it can all help out. And what I want to kind of, you know, have these little moments here as we move along, things to kind of save you a little bit of time. You know, research does take time. As I alluded before, you're not going to instantly find what you need for any given research for a college course. But at the same time, I want to, you know, kind of include things to kind of help you save a little time here, shave a few minutes off there, make it a little easier there and such. And this is one of those times. When you start your research, probably feeling a little loose, uncomfortable, not finding a lot of good things. Your first few searches may net you nothing that you choose to hang on to because it's just not quite what you want for the, uh, the assignment. But as you work your way along, you've probably found it happened in the past, you'll find that first article, that first website, whatever it might be, that you go, oh, let me print that one out. Let me throw that on my, uh, my flash drive. I'm going to save that one. Don't just save an article or a website or something like that. Spend a moment and ask yourself, why did I like this one amongst everything else I've seen? Why was this one good enough for me to save it? And look at the information kind of with an eye for those key words. Did that author use any words or terms that might be really good ones to put back into the search and, you know, try, you know, improve my search that way? Maybe there's some concepts, uh, some subjects or something that are being discussed that you may turn into some keywords as well. So keep an eye out for that, particularly in some of your earlier um, successes when looking for uh, information. And I have a question for you. We just want to kind of talk about information for a moment, kind of in a little broader sense and, and all. Imagine you're out there on the web, you run into a blog that kind of catches your eye and you start following this blog. And this blog involves a person who has a medical condition and they're blogging about all the trials and tribulations they've been having with their medical condition. They've had these awful, awful headaches that come on very suddenly from time to time. And they have seen many doctors, have taken many different medications, have had all sorts of treatments, had CAT scans done of their head and such. And they've never really been diagnosed. They've never, you know, it's still a problem. No doctor has been able to really help them out. They're kind of frustrated. They've run into doctors that think they're, you know, it's all in their head, kind of, you know, a psychosomatic kind of a thing. There's really no true problem. But they know there is. And this person talks about these problems and, you know, you follow them along. And eventually one day you come to a blog post. And this blog post, the, the whole tone of it's different. It's more bright. It's more cheery. And this person is telling, you know, it starts blogging and saying, I have got a diagnosis. I have found a doctor that has told me what I have. 
and I feel so much better just knowing what I have. Even though I haven't gotten any treatment yet and such, I just feel so much better that I have a diagnosis. I know I'm on the right path now. And what that person has said is that I've been told I have exploding head syndrome. Now, I'd like to ask you the question, what do you think? Exploding head syndrome, is it a truly recognized medical condition? or something I made up just to kind of sound interesting as, as part of this uh, discussion this evening. We'll give you a moment to kind of uh, vote in here, see what people think. And it looks like the no's are winning big time. Okay, well when it comes to information of any sorts, <coughs> excuse me, um, it's always good to kind of look for, for you know the information. You know, find a credible source particularly something like this you're not familiar with. You know, throughout college, throughout your um, time in college, you'll be doing research on subjects you aren't real familiar with, and sometimes you have to ask, should I believe this or shouldn't I? I mean, you find this on the web, are you really going to believe it or not? So I stepped out into our databases, and lo and behold, here's an article from one of our databases that discusses exploding head syndrome. Yes, it's a recognized medical condition. I don't know a whole lot about it. I can tell you it is an extremely rare condition. Consequently, that's why most people have not heard of it. It's also something that you know happens kind of when people are dozing off, falling asleep. Um, not really like going to bed kind of asleep usually, but usually imagine yourself being uh, you know, on the couch at home watching a boring movie and you kind of start nodding off as you're falling asleep. It seems to happen then. And it, it is a sudden, like, massive, multiple migraine headache that just kind of comes on almost instantly. Um, it seems that these uh, headaches happen more to women than men, but beyond that, I really don't know much more. I haven't done much more research about exploding head syndrome. But it, again, it's a real, medi you know, recognized medical condition, and just kind of want to make the, you know, point out that, you know, sometimes information sounds a bit unusual, and in reality, it's actually good, valid information. I'd like to talk about our databases now, those collections of articles from magazines, newspapers, scholarly journals and such, which you'll be needing for this course, as well as other coursework. We have over 60 databases available to you, collections of articles from magazines, newspapers, scholarly journals. Um, be aware that every single article from every single database is not going to be available to you in its entirety, full text right on the screen. Contractual, copyright, legal reasons make that impossible. However, um, with um, the you know the articles that are not available to you in their, in their in their entirety, you'll still get an abstract or a summary of the article, so you have some sense of what it's about. The title may sound really good, and you can kind of read through the abstract and decide, yeah, I really need to be able to uh, see this article or not. Um, even the full text articles, most of them have an abstract, which can be helpful as well. Now, if you run into one of these abstract-only articles, always please contact us. We'll be glad to help you um, hunt it down. In some cases, for example, the Wall Street Journal has exclusive contracts with a few database companies. So you may find the Wall Street Journal articles in many public, in many databases. You won't find it full text in all the databases. And I can point you towards the databases we subscribe to that has the um, has the uh, Wall Street Journal included. You can access the uh, databases if you're on campus, anywhere as it's tied into the college's network directly, here at West Windsor, down at the James Kearney campus in Trenton, uh, no problem getting in. And what you find is yours to use as you see fit. If you wish to print it out, if you wish to email it, you wish to download it, just read it on the screen. Whatever you wish to do, it's yours to use as you see fit. Now, how do we get to these databases? Well, from any of the college's uh, web pages, from the home page and such, there are the drop-down menus in the gold bar near the top of the page. And the fourth option over, student services, there's a drop-down menu there. Second one down, library services, that's where you'll find the library residing. Uh, clicking on that will take you to the library's home page, which looks like this. The important thing to take note on the home page, the figure pointing to the left-hand column, these links on the left-hand column are constant throughout the library's web presence. So as you move through different places at the college's website for the library, these links will always be there. The figure's pointing to the database link below at the catalog for books, um, other 
important resources and such are also included there, things that you're likely to need to use. And that will always be there so you can easily, easily locate that. Now, I didn't mention getting the things off campus yet. All of you folks are currently off campus and may not be coming up on campus very often, if at all, and want to talk about how to access the databases from off campus. Databases are costly. They don't come real, real cheap. And in order to, um, when we subscribe to the databases, we sign an annual contract with the database companies. And when we get the contract and we sign it, we get access for every single student, faculty, and staff member here at the college. And when we get access for everybody, we also kind of promise as part of the contractual agreement that we will allow only Mercer County Community College students, faculty, and staff access to the databases through our web pages. So when you're on campus, you're tied directly into the college's network, no problem getting in. However, when you're off campus, you do need to log in to access the databases. Login's fairly straightforward. You need two pieces of information. Firstly, you'll need what I call your email name. You've been issued an email address by the college, something at student.mccc.edu. The part that appears on the screen in red, that's what you put in for the database uh, entry. Database entry is completely independent and separate from your student account, the My Mercer portal, and everything else. So how you log into it is totally different and such than you would to, say, look at your grades or check your schedule or something like that. You'll notice I have two different uh, formatted email addresses on the screen. Uh, within the past year or maybe a little bit more now, the college has been issuing a newer style format of email addresses being first name dot last name. So, for example, I would be martin.crabtree at student.mccc.edu. However, um, prior to that, the email addresses were in a format of last name, first initial. And what we have found in many cases, if you have been a student for some period of time here at the college and were issued one of these last name, first initial formatted email addresses at some point in time, that is likely to be the format you'll need to use to enter our databases. So if you go to enter our databases and you, you know, have a first name dot last name email address that you're currently using, but you know you had the older format at one time, you, if you can't get in with the new format, try the old format, it usually works for you. And it's, I, I can't say it's 100%, it's probably well over 90% of the time, not quite 100% of the time, that's what will need to happen. Your full last name is what you put in as your password, all lowercase. And if you have any um, punctuation in your last name, if you have a hyphenated last name, an apostrophe in your last name, a space in your last name, any punctuation of any sort needs to be included in the password. Email addresses, for example, cannot have a space in it. It's just not um, acceptable for any sort of email address to have a space in the email address itself. But if, you're, if your last name does have a space in it, you still need to put the space in as far as your, your password goes. This is what the uh, screen would look like uh, if I were off campus trying to enter one of the databases. Your uh, email name goes in the first box, your last name in the second box, enter the database and off you go. There is contact information at the bottom of the screen should you get stuck and need some help. Uh, you can always contact the library and we'll help you out. Um, there is a um, kind of a virtual handout for you that discusses the uh, library's online resources and such a bit and on the one page in the middle it also talks about the uh, password and such so if you don't remember and such it's on page two of the handout that's um, linked that should be available to you as part of your course material so if you don't remember and the other information in here is also quite good I'll be talking about some of you know some of the things today some other things in a future webinar and some things I may not touch on quite as uh, much in detail. It's kind of a good uh, overall coverage of online resources and such things to consider, what things are available to you from the college library. Another one of those moments, making your life a little bit easier. I mentioned those article abstracts, those summaries of the articles. Uh, some articles, particularly scholarly journal articles, can be quite long, 10, 20 pages long. I call that average for a journal article. However, um, there's no need to read, say, a 15-page long article just to decide if it's worth your while to use it in your paper. No need to spend all that time. Instead, 
you read that paragraph or two summary that comes with the article, that abstract, it'll give you a good idea what the article's about. And from there, you can kind of decide, yes, it's worth my time, or no, not worth my time, let me move on. Again, save yourself a little bit of time using the abstracts. Now, with the databases, you have some added search options also. Again, something to save a little bit of time. Any search tool, a database search, for example, become familiar with all of its features, all of its abilities, because the better you are at using that tool, the more effective and efficient you can be at finding the information that you need quickly and effectively. With the databases, if you wish to see full text articles, I don't want to have to deal with any of those uh, summary only articles. Just give me the full text articles. You can check a box and all your results will meet that criteria. If you need scholarly or peer reviewed journal articles, the terms are used kind of interchangeably. Again, there's a box, you can check it off and everything will come from that kind of information. If you need a specific date or date range, for example, you can also specify that. A couple databases that you're likely to use for, um, for this course, Academic Search Premier from, ProQuest, uh, from EBSCOhost, I'm sorry, and ProQuest Central, two broad databases covering many subject areas. And either of these will work well because they have, you know, humanities, science, psychology, everything kind of built into them. They're the most heavily used databases here at the college. Again, some articles will not be available to you in their entirety full text, but many, many are, and you should be able to find uh, plenty of information uh, in these databases. Uh, the databases uh, will also help you with your MLA formatting, and we'll show you all of that um, right here. I'm going to step out onto the web for a moment and kind of show you how the databases are laid out. Again, off of student services, off the uh, college's web page, there we are, library services. Clicking on that would take us to our home page. Clicking on the online databases here on the left brings us to the page we're at right now. We have taken these um, databases and broken them down by subject very broadly, architecture, art and music, business and such. Above architecture are all the categories, the subject headings we've given to the databases. The general heading is where you'll find those broad general coverage databases. I'm going to click on that. It saves having to scroll down the, uh, the screen. Academic search, first one, ProQuest Central at the bottom. Both will work, um, work well for you. I'll click on ProQuest Central and enter, um, enter that database. In ProQuest Central, we have a box. We can put in our, our search terms. And kind of given we have two courses going, I'm going to kind of blend everything. I'm going to put in American Dream. You'll notice I'm putting it in quotation marks. Uh, I'm kind of getting the uh, red squiggly telling me I spelled it wrong. I'm not using uppercase letters. The databases are not fussy about um, uppercase or lowercase. And there we go. We'll put in Joseph Campbell and American Dream. See if those two concepts, people, and such kind of intersect in our uh, in our searches. Um, I'm also going to ask for full text articles. I just want to see full text articles that I can view and I can print out. I'll execute my search by clicking the magnifying glass. And lo and behold, I get 108 searches, or 108 results. And so there's 108 things that combine both the concept of the American dream and Joseph Campbell. They use both of those terms. I'm Jack, going to look at the third you, one. What's Joseph Campbell's American dream? <laughs> oh, I'm, I guess we're not hearing her at the moment. I'm going to use this third one as an example because it comes in two full text options. And the database articles will come in either of these full text options or both, sometimes one, sometimes the other. Makes for a good example to dis discuss the article as an example. The preview icon off to the side, if I hover my uh, cursor over that, I get a pop-up window that includes the abstract. Here's that summary of what the article's about. So I can read this and decide, oh yeah, I want to read that article more closely, or no, it's not interesting. This is a, a very lengthy uh, journal article here. It's uh, what, uh, 25, 29 pages long. So here we go, something a little easier to kind of decide whether it's even worth my while getting into. If I like what I see, I can click on the title of the article. It will take me into the article. I'll get the abstract 
when I step into the article as well. The full text format appears below. And if I, you know, I can sit here and read that if I wish. If I wish to view the PDF formatted article, there's always a link that will take you to the PDF formatted article. If it's only in the PDF format, nothing else, there'll be nothing on the screen below the abstract. So I'll click on the PDF link just to open up the article in this format. The words are exactly the same. It's just a, a difference of presentation. This looks a bit more like a, a scan of the publication and things like that. Um, you do have some um, some options here if you wish to print things out and such. Um, do work with the toolbars associated with the reader that you have. Sometimes it's a pop-up. Sometimes it shows up as a regular toolbar. Kind of depends on how your browser is uh, <coughs> is set up and such. But um, hey, if Martin? you wish to, yes. Can I, can I just j jump in here for a second? There's a couple things I just want to say, too. Um, in, in this, I don't know if this goes for the Joseph Campbell papers, but I know it goes for ours with the current paper on the American Dream, is that I mean, also before um, we talked about the limiting the date range that you when you do your search. Um, and, and think about for a minute that the paper that we're writing right now, the critical question is to what extent is the vision of base and Adams, this notion of a kind of American dream, this ideal America, uh, how, how possible is it today? Um, having journal articles that came from the 1970s or magazine articles may not be that helpful to you. Um, so this is where you want to be particularly um, you know, thoughtful about the, you know, are your articles coming from within you know, the last um, couple of years? I mean, in, in particular, think about, think about for a minute the fact that um, We've had this economic downturn since 2008, and uh, and and that you know the articles that you have might have a great bearing on it, uh, on what you're doing. Um, the other thing too that I also just want to mention here with the articles like this one here, "One Dream: Barack Obama, Race, and the American Dream," is that when you get a PDF of of a journal article, you're going to also find that the page numbers are in there, as if you photocopied it right off of like you had the hard copy. Um, and so when you do things like you want to quote something, like say, for example, there's some text here that you actually want to quote and you want to cite it, um, or even if you're paraphrasing, but it comes off of page 125, you have that page number there. Um, a journal article or a magazine article that's in HTML format won't have any page numbers. That's not really a problem. It doesn't mean you can't use that source. It's just like one of the things I just have known that I've always liked is the fact that with a, with a PDF, it's it's like you really did have the, the actual thing. And I have my research assistant here tonight. So, <laughs> all right. Thank you, Martin. Oh, sure thing. Um, I'm going to step back to the other other format for a moment and talk about yeah. a few other things. When you found the, the, the article and such, uh, if you say come to our library and ask for some help, and you wish to uh, email things um, to yourself to work on later, clicking on the email link will give you the options um, to email things. Under bibliography, the checkbox here, if you turn it on, you can, it, act, it activates the drop-down menu. And if we work our way down, here we go, MLA 7th edition. We'll have the MLA formatted citation for the article emailed to us along with the um, actual article. Your email address, your name goes into these boxes here. The subject line will be your ProQuest research unless you choose to change it. Uh, it's purely your option if you choose to change it, but I would encourage you if you have an email account. You don't have to use the school's email account to email things. If you have a, a Yahoo account or something else, Gmail account that you prefer to use, that's fine. But if you have to deal with a lot of junk email, you got spam filtering, junk email folders, and things like that, um, things may wind up being dropped in there when they're first sent to you. And sometimes we've had students just about every semester contact us, say, hey, I emailed things to myself. They never showed up. What's going on? And it turns out that they didn't recognize what it was. They either deleted it or it's sitting there in a, a spam folder or something like that. So you know, changing the subject line to English 102 article or American Dream article or you know, Hero Journey Joseph Campbell article, whatever, might be helpful as uh, as well. Kind of your option on that front. If you wish to print out the article in the full text format, the print option is here. The site link here, you're working at home, you don't have to email the article to yourself to view the citation. 
Again, we need to change things to MLA. When you're working in ProQuest databases, once you've changed it to MLA once, it'll remain there, but the opening default is always to the APA format. But if I change it to uh, MLA format, here we go. MLA citation, copy, paste, drop it into Word, I'm almost good to go. I say almost, firstly, because I will guarantee you that the formatting in Word will not be correct. Margins won't line up, lettering size will vary, font style will be different. Uh, the hanging indentation, where the second line or subsequent lines are all knocked in a bit, may not happen as well. Um, also, from time to time, this is one of those articles that has that. The title of the article has been put all in capital letters, and that's not what um, should happen in the MLA. It should be kind of you know the first letter uh, capitalized type thing. But for some reason, this is the one kind of sort of error that we run into once in a while. It's not real, real common, but something just to keep an eye out for that you have a, um, a title of an article um, in all in capital letters. You will need to adjust that, particularly if you have a, um, a fussy uh, professor that's very picky about MLA and such. I'm going to go back to my results for just one moment, given um, some of what Dr. Tabor had spoken of. Uh, we have a number of options here on the left hand, or right hand side, I'm sorry, to help us kind of focus in a little bit. Um, I find the subject options sometimes handy to work with. They give me some subjects here, but if I go for more options, it gives me a number of options I can, uh, I can choose, and I can not only include but exclude things. So maybe I'm not interested in motion pictures or book reviews. I can throw those out and have my results include everything else instead. So it's kind of your call, but it's quite, quite a powerful tool to both include and exclude things. Also, the date that uh, the articles come from, the earliest ones from 1987. As Dr. Tabor mentioned, you know, thinking about the American dream today and what somebody said 30 years ago or so might not quite be the, uh, the way to go. So we can either um, specify a certain date range, put in specific dates or years, or we can just kind of grab the slider bar here and slide it up here and say, well, let's go up to 2008 and forward. We'll update the uh, list. And now we're down to 30 articles that are all from 2008 going forward that have both of our search terms, Joseph Campbell and American Dream in it. So you know, there's a lot of things you can do to kind of manipulate your, uh, your searches. Yep. Now we got time for another question. Again, kind of a general informational question. In this case, I want to pose a question to you. Is there an artist from New Zealand who may, it works in toast? Artists works in oil, you know, there are artists that work in oils and watercolors, they sculpt in marble, they work in many media. I wonder, I'm asking, is there a Maurice Bennett from New Zealand who has created works of art out of toast? Or am I making this one up? And I, seeing a lot of people thinking yes, and I'm not sure if it's because people know this is a fact or not, or whether they are just kind of second guessing me going, well, if they got me with that exploding head center, there's got to be a toast guy out there. Well, again, I'm going to step on out into our databases, and lo and behold, yes, indeed, toast artist Maurice Bennett does exist, has done a, a number of, of uh, portraits and things and such, and I want to share with you a couple of his works of art, his Elvis Presley and his Barack Obama, all done in toast. So again, you know, sometimes information may sound a little unusual, and in some cases it, be, it can be quite real. So finally, I want to talk a little bit about using the information that you find. You'll be using other people's thoughts, words, and ideas, and really that's what, you know, part of what college is about. The college experience is a little bit than, say, a traditional high school kind of experience. In high school, you spend most of your learning time in the classroom, listening to your instructor, taking copious notes, reading your textbook, studying for tests, and then kind of spilling everything you heard in class and read in your notes and, and textbook back onto the test to kind of prove that you had learned the information that's being uh, taught. In college, that kind of learning still occurs. But another bigger piece of college learning and something that you know, occurs even more and more as you work your way further along in college is that you're expected to take what you learn within the course, within the textbook and such, but that's not everywhere, the only source of information. You look for other sources of information. Your assignments 
will ask you to take outside information. What are others saying about this topic we're talking about? And you're kind of doing that with this course. You know, find some other articles. What are other people saying about the American dream, thinking about this concept of the hero journey that Joseph Campbell has um, spoken of? And how do you kind of, you know, take these other thoughts and ideas that nobody talked to you about, you know, your professor didn't discuss it with you, but you read it, you want to think about it, roll around in your head, incorporate it into everything else that's been talked about in class, what you've read, and kind of turn it into a, a blending of all these pieces of information into your writing and such. Because really, think about it, when you're out in the real world, you know, you're not going to have, you know, a teacher there telling you, well, here's the information you need to know in order to do your job. You're expected to kind of do your job, and if you need to find things out, you need to know where to look and how to incorporate this knowledge, this understanding that you get from information into your work to be successful at whatever you're doing. You always want to give credit to the authors of the work you're using. If anything, it's just the right thing to do. And it's what ex is what, what is expected of you in college. You're expected to use other people's thoughts, words, and ideas is, and you're expected to give them credit. And we're talking about not only the facts and the conclusions and such that a, um, a person presents, but the words that they use. And that's often more of a stumbling block for students. How do I put this great paragraph into my own words? How do I take this idea and incorporate it into what I'm writing? And that's, you know, a skill that takes practice as well. And you don't want to just take a paragraph and change two words in it, slap it into your paper, and call it your work. It's not. That's just plagiarism. But at the same time, you know, if you find that somebody said something so eloquently that you just don't know how to say it any better, put quotation marks around it, according to so-and-so, quotation marks, and put it into your paper. That's, that's fine if you don't overdo it. And you certainly don't want to be doing this for entire paragraphs. A sentence or two, something like that, is about what you should be expecting to use. For this course, you'll be using the MLA formatting. MLA format is kind of a book. It's about yay thick and such that discusses everything you ever wanted to know and then some about how to format a paper of some sort. It goes beyond the, the level of, of things you'll need for this course. Imagine, you know, you're working on your doctoral thesis, you know, getting your PhD, that book length uh, research paper that you need to, uh, you know, as part of the completion to get your PhD. Oh, Dr. Tabor, you've raised your hand. Uh, How can I help you? I just want to put in, I just want to kick in one comment here. Um, you got, um, there's, there's nothing wrong with citing too much. Um, and, and one of the things I want to sort of encourage folks to do, if, if in doubt, cite. Um, as a student, I have never had anything ever marked down because I was too um, diligent about citing or footnoting or any of those things. Where you get in trouble is when you don't cite enough. Um, so if there's ever a moment where you think it's unclear where your words and ideas end and another uh, a source's words and ideas begin, well, do something, put in a citation. Um, and again, again I, I'm, I'm happy to say, oh, you, you have plenty of citations here. You don't need to have as many. Um, there's no, I, I, trust me, I will not mark your papers down for, for over citing. Um, the problem is, is when you don't cite enough. So again, I just want to emphasize, in, when in doubt, cite. Cite, 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 okay? And I give it back to you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, certainly, you know, I, I can't agree more with what Dr. Tabor's um, saying, you know, citations, and that's really the focus of a lot of the MLA formatting in this course is how to cite properly, citing when it's appropriate and such, and plenty of citations uh, certainly um, should work well for you in your, uh, in your paper. Unfortunately, the MLA book is not available in, in its entirety online. We can't easily offer that uh, to you. So we do have some citation guides, uh, a link on our website to uh, citation guides. I'll step out real quickly just to show you what things look like there. Again, I'm back to one of the library's web pages, and about halfway down the list here's citation guides. Clicking on that takes us to the links here. We have one for MLA, for APA, for Chicago style, the three most heavily used styles here at the college. There are others out there, but these are the ones we use here at our college. Clicking on the MLA link will take us out to the OWL website from Purdue University. The OWL website. Um, the Online Writing Laboratory, a great kind of overview and summary of everything MLA. The APA link also takes you to uh, the OWL website, and it can be quite helpful in, 
in uh, helping you understand everything. Uh, they have a whole section on in-text citations where you're writing your paper. How do I, you know, incorporate, you know, the fact that this fact came from so-and-so as I'm writing. Um, they give you, you know, a whole discussion on how to do it, give you some examples and such that um, make it quite uh, helpful to uh, work with. The Works Cited page at the end of your, your paper where you list out these are all the sources I used, depending on the format of the information. Was it from a book? Was it from a magazine or newspaper? Uh, was it from, you know, something online? Um, electronic sources is kind of the term, the catch-all for anything you saw on the screen. So if you saw an article, even though it's an article from the New York Times, if you use the database, saw it on the screen, you need to look in the electronic sources for things. Same thing, you know, same thing for anything you, you view on the screen. Um, if I click on any of these, for example, books, they start off giving me the basic format. Here's the basic form, last name, comma, first name, period, title of book, and italics, period, etc., and how to lay things out. And then they give me a lot of examples, and I find that most helpful. I, I know I work well personally from uh, seeing examples of how to do things. And, you know, there are very, very many different variations and such. What if there's one author, if there's more than one author? Um, what happens, you know, for example, if the book has no author listed? What do I do then? And it kind of goes on to all sorts of different variations and things uh, for you to work with. An anthology, the textbook for uh, English 102, um, has a lot of, you know, readings in it. The anthology, a collection of stories or poems or poems and stories and plays or whatever it might be. Um, here's how you kind of cite the entire book. And then if you're using a certain example out of an anthology, uh, how do I do that? It's actually listed by the author of that short story or whatever you're uh, including. Yes, Dr. Tabor. Yeah, and one more thing too. Um, keep in mind that in 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 my in my class, um, we have a lot of uh, we have audio, we have NPR podcasts, we have um, we have a documentary, we have a lot of digitized media. Um, so when you look at th this, is also in in your textbook, folks, that I have. Have the the curious researcher, um, but also on the website, um, there there are citations for things that are not necessarily uh, books or journal articles that aren't sort of printed things. There are citations for audio files, um, sound recordings, films, video cassettes, DVDs, uh, personal interviews. Um, there are a lot of different kinds of of sources that you can source. Um, you know. And, and keep in mind that it's called a works cited. It's not it's not called a, a, a bibliography. And I think part of that is that we're no longer working it, simply. It, okay, <laughs> uh, we're no longer working in um, just simply printed material. So just keep that in mind. Um, and sometimes you have to do a little thinking and, and bringing together a few different kinds of um, sources. A, a, you know, a, a a digital source, which is a sound recording may have some qualities of a DVD, but yet you received it online. So um, anyway, just keep that in mind. Okay, there's a lot, a lot there if you take a look at it. All right, thank you. Sure thing. And while Dr. Tate was speaking, I kind of moved over to the other common sources link. Here we go. Here's how you do an interview. An interview. Um, you know, speeches, you know, other things, a painting, a sculpture, a photograph. So a lot of different things, films, movies, and such, and kind of work your way, again, down the list of different um, different sources and such, whatever you need. It, it includes a lot of things. It's not 100% complete, but it's uh, really quite uh, quite thorough. I wanted to mention, you were talking before about how your book, The Curious Researcher, has all those sort of non-traditional sources and how to cite them and all that. Um, our book, too, just so my class knows, um, also has, like, the list of how to cite, you know, videos and and podcasts and things like that, so so they don't have to worry. If, if you do have a source like that, you know, you can look in the MLA section and you'll find it. Yeah, and, 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 and I think the thing I was trying to say before is, folks, you might run into something where um, it, it's, it's, it's available online, it's, it's a sound recording, um, but you got it online. There, there's sometimes we have, to, we have to do some merging of sources sometimes. Um, I'm trying to think of an example of that. Um, you know, um, uh, Barack Ob in my class, we, we looked at Barack Obama's 2008 acceptance speech. Um, part of that is you're watching a YouTube video of something that was broadcast on C-SPAN. Um, so 
there's some interesting components you might have to bring together for that. Um, but then again, you could be using simply the transcript, and you're not using the, the YouTube video at all. You're just going to work with the transcript, which I think comes from the New York Times. Um, so anyway, that, that's why these books are handbooks. They're there to help you out um, and to give guidance for when you come upon something that you, you, know, you don't quite know how to source it. Well, take a look, look it up, look at the example, and go from there. They're very, very, very handy. While I'm here, let me make a pitch for something, too. Um, I'm sure Professor Votman has the same pitch. Office hours. We are your, we're teachers online, but we actually exist in real time. Um, and, and I have an office. They keep me on campus for a certain period every week. Uh, my office is LA 133. I have office hours on Mondays from 12 to 1 and Tuesdays and Thursdays from about 8.45 to 10.15. Um, I generally don't have office hours on Wednesday, but that doesn't mean if I, if I have time, we could schedule something that works with your schedule and mine. Um, kudos to those of you out there who have come to, uh, who have come and uh, have participated in office hours. And, um, but by all means, just because you guys are my, in my online class, it doesn't mean that you can't come to face-to-face -face office hours, bring your writing in, ask questions, and uh, take advantage of us in real time. Sure. I'll, just, I'll just repeat that. So my office is LA-121, as you guys should know. I've met one person from the online class so far. I'd love to meet more of you in person. So. Um, also, the, the online office hours I have on Saturday mornings, I know it's kind of early, um, but so far I haven't had anyone want to chat with me yet, so if anyone's up and, and you know, has uh, any questions, I... I'll I've had one you. person. Uh, my, my online, my virtual online office hours are on Friday mornings from 8 to 10. Um, I've had one person who has been a, a, a regular participant, and thank you very much. But you could, there, if you go to our, if you go to the first page when you log on to our course, you see there it says um, office hours, and there's a time. It's like a, it's a chat room kind of thing, and you click on that, and then you can actually participate in a dialog box, not unlike the one that you see here with Adobe Connect. Um, and then we can go back and forth. I've also done phone office hours with people, too. And I realize that part of the reason why a lot of folks are taking an online class is because of difficult, work, difficult schedules work schedules and so on. So we can also work something out if you want to actually talk on the phone. And I found that to be a useful, a useful way to communicate. All right, everyone. Listen, thank you very much. And thanks for joining us. Tomorrow is going to be a very, very snowy day. Um, don't be a hero. Stay home, stay safe, stay warm. Be safe. Thank you guys for attending. All right. All right. See you. Good night, everyone. Bye, good night. Good night. Can I say good night? Can I say good night to everybody? Good night. Good night. <laughs>